Good morning, everybody. Points for making it nice and early here on, uh, from New Orleans. It's, it's good, right? Yes, good and, and bright. A little, a little bright, bright yeah. on. come on. Um, Jimmy, thanks for sitting down. This is awesome. So you guys are at the crossroads of, of digital media right now. What is happening in this crazy industry we're both in? There's obviously a lot of things happening in our industry right now. That's why it's so exciting. Or it's exciting if you like, if you like change. If you don't like change, it's not a great industry yeah. to be in right now. I think we're uh, you know, in the middle of this perfect storm where things are moving uh, you know, for 50 years. You know, you know, big media companies have been broadcasting. Media has obviously over the last five, 10 years been democratized. We've seen social media platforms changing the way uh, you know, publishers and media companies are able to distribute their content and also the way that people are interacting, engaging with the content. And I think obviously that has you know, you know, brought a whole new perspective to media, but also a whole new way of doing things. On top of that, you then have the new formats that has come in. Of course, we all know, um, you know mobile is now the first device, uh, you know, text is becoming video, uh, things that used to happen on your own platform, meaning y your own website, uh, if you create content, then that content now is not necessarily consumed on that website. It, it might be consumed on a Snapchat Discover channel or on a Facebook instant article. So, you know, all of these things obviously means that, you know, the ecosystem is being disrupted and you need to find new ways of getting your content across, of, of engaging an audience. And how does AOL adapt to that? Because for so many years, AOL was a massive portal that people, it was a destination. I mean, I remember even in the early days of Forbes.com, we would hope to get a slideshow on AOL, the front page, because it'd be like a traffic fire hose. But now, as you said, with social and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat, everything's being kind of disintermediated. How do you go from a giant portal to kind of survive in the social world? I, I think over, you know, what you've seen AOL do over the last five, five, six years is AOL has obviously transformed itself into a modern media and technology company. Uh, and what I mean with that is that AOL is no longer just AOL. Actually, if you, if you walk outside here, you know, unless you're 45 plus, I'm not even sure that you know what AOL is because yeah. obviously AOL was the company that brought the internet and the email to America. But you know that's 25 years ago. So we've had to transform the company uh, to stay relevant. Uh, so AOL, as such, uh, as a brand, has has to that extent taken a backseat. And and what you you know what you see today is really you know a number of brands, right? You you heard an intro. Uh, HuffPost uh, is obviously one of our big brands. Uh, that's what people are seeing. They don't necessarily know that that's AOL. They see TechCrunch and Gadget, Movie Phone. We have you know 15 big brands that you know, that are touching 400 million consumers on a monthly basis. So you can say we've gone from having that one destination mm -hmm. to now having, you know, uh, a lot of destinations that are touching consumers in many different ways. And, and then to a question about what do we do to then stay relevant outside of our own destinations, then obviously it also becomes, you know, not only having those distinct uh, consumer platforms, but also having a challenge strategy so you can actually take your content and make sure that it is relevant uh, in a Facebook uh, instant article or on a Snapchat di Discover channel. So the content you're creating on your own denominated is not necessarily the same story that needs to kind of sit on a Facebook channel or on a, uh, a Snapchat channel. You actually have to do many different versions of uh, potentially the same story. So with all these brands, you said, you know, mentioned TechCrunch and, and, and HuffPo, does each brand have its own special strategy in terms of, of mobile and distribution, or do you kind of, AOL has like a grand strategy and everyone kind of follows that, that oh, system? It, it, it's both. Of course, uh, at AOL, you know, that's one of the reasons why we created this new structure where I moved from HuffPost and kind of, I'm, I'm now overseeing the whole portfolio that we have, is because we obviously need to, you know, drive the synergies that, that there are. But at the same time, as I just said before, I do believe if you want to be relevant today, you, know, you, need, you, know, uh, you need to be authentic to your audience. You know, so a HuffPost need obviously to do what a HuffPost does best. You know, they need to create the best possible content for that audience or utility experiences. Uh, so we need to do that. But then there's obviously there's some scale things that will allow us to have uh, conversations with some of these distribution platforms that we might not you know, achieve the same things have we done it, you know, brand by brand. And recently there's been a big kind of debate, at least in the media world, about, you know, 
well done stories and kind of clickbait stuff that's just, you know, junk food. And obviously you need, you need a little bit of both. You can't just give everyone vegetables or you can't give everyone just whipped cream. No. How do you balance that out, especially with all the different brands that you serve? Um, I, think, I think that's a great question because I think without any doubt what we've seen over the last five years, we've seen you know, a race uh, for uh, size and scale in the sense that you know, you've definitely seen a lot of clickbait stories, right? The 27 whatever things, uh, we've seen a lot of that. Um, I, I think, you know, and obviously scale matters, but scale only matters if, if you're able to obviously find ways of uh, keeping that audience, but also monetizing that audience. And I think, you know, as we move into the next phase, scale is still going to be important, but scale is only going to be important for you if you find that balance to your point. You know, if, if you only have uh, those... Uh, clickbait stories, uh, if that has been your strategy to drive the biggest possible audience, then I think you, know, you, might, you, know, you might be in for a wake-up call because I think the audience uh, will, will not stay with you, they will go somewhere else and that's kind of at what we're seeing right now as the ecosystem is, is, is changing because you know, a lot of things are up for grabs when suddenly uh, you know, Facebook open up the Firehose or a YouTube or a Snapchat, you know, uh, because, you know, those audiences, as I said before, they need something that's distinctly different. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just about the clickbait stories. I, I can promise you, if you want to be, even if you want to be considered to be, you know, a Snapchat Discover channel, you know, they have very specific ideas about mm -hmm. what you need to do to, to even do that. And obviously the same goes for a Facebook or a Twitter. So, so I think, you know, uh, the, the balance is important, but even more, uh, you know, the, the, the hunt for uh, the biggest scale, I think it's not that it's over, but, but also, you know, I think we've all seen over the last couple of weeks that some of the companies that, that have grown tremendously and done really well, some of the young media companies here have, have seen a setback because, you know, when monetization is not following as fast, mm -hmm. uh, then that's going to be a struggle. Speaking of audience, we have a great audience here. Show of hands, who here gets most of their news from like a social feed? Okay, a lot of hands. How about who has, goes to like a destination often, like an a absolute website? All right, and who reads most of their news on mobile? All right, so we, a lot of, that's a, yes. I think that's a big change than we would have seen no, two years Exactly, ago. that is a huge change from two years ago. So, okay, so mobile's huge, but also it's a smaller screen, the ads are smaller, more annoying, and more expensive data-wise. So how do we tackle this? As everyone's going to these little tiny screens, how do we serve up ads that aren't disruptive, disruptive to reading, but also pay the bills? Yeah, I, think, I think as an industry, we have, uh, we have some work to do here. Uh, I think, honestly, if you think about you know, the mobile device, to your point, the screen is obviously smaller. Uh, but I think we already knew from uh, the desktop experiences that we've been creating uh, for the last 10, 15 years that the banner model, the display model in its current form is really not serving us well. You know, if you think about it from my perspective, I'm, I'm a publisher, but you know, if you're a publisher, first and foremost, what you should care about is that you create engaging content and utility experiences that engages an audience. That's first and foremost. Then you should think about how you monetize it. Sometimes today, I think we, we do it the other way around. We are kind of like, you know, I'm, see, I'm seeing a lot of examples where people are putting the ads in front of the content, and I'm like, you know, so you want people to consume an ad before they even know what the content is? I think that's the wrong way to go about it. And I think when we talk about the mobile device, I think, you know, the, ma the banner model for me is broken. You know, personally, you know, there's nothing more annoying than having a banner on the device with a small little cross that you can't close yeah, and yeah. it opens up and you're ending up in 15 other different experiences. If that's not an annoying experience, then I don't know what it is. So I think we need to kind of think about how do we create, you know, uh, interesting, engaging formats. And I think some of the formats is obviously video will help us. I think, you know, video, you know, done in an interesting way can actually, you know, help us uh, monetize the mobile audience. I think, you know, some of the native streams, uh, you know, I think, you know, that's, that's a better way of doing it. But, but I think we, we also need to see, you know, other formats than, uh, than those. But there are, some, there are some good formats and there are some formats I'm not a fan of. Mm -hmm. And first, like, I'm dating myself here, but AOL used to be such a tech leader. I mean, AOL was my first browser. It was my first internet server. It was my first email. It was my first messenger with, with IM. That's kind of taken a back seat recently, but I know, on such under Verizon now, you have a new lab and a new kind of whole division on tech. Yeah. What do you folk? What, what can we expect in the next you know, year or two? Uh, you know, I, I think 
one of the things that is obviously interesting as I, as I talk about, right, you know, for the last five years, we've focused a lot on the content side of things and, and, and the ad tech behind it to, to obviously monetize that audience. But, but for the next wave, I think it, it's really about the utilities because, you know, a social platform is a utility, so what, what are the next utilities? And, and, and obviously, if you look at what's going on in the world around us, you know, the um, instant messaging, you know, platforms uh, or devices, uh, I think is, is very, very interesting. I, you know, I think if you look at what's happening with the WeChat in, in China, where it's becoming, it, it's basically becoming the portal that AOL was 20, 25 years yeah. ago. WeChat has 600 million users. It's a whole ecosystem. You can do commerce. You can do a lot of things within your your, your messaging app. And I think that for us is is interesting and something that we obviously want to see. You know, you know, how do we play in that ecosystem? Or you know, do we do we have to do something aggressive in in, in that space? And and then uh, I also think you know, live video. We uh, just uh, six months ago we acquired. Uh, something called Canvas, which is a younger version of a Meerkat or Periscope. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so obviously tapping into that whole notion of people want to kind of distribute their experiences here and now and, and share it with their audiences uh, and, and allow them to, uh, to edit and do things with that feed uh, on the fly. I think th those are things that, that, that we are definitely uh, leaning into from a from a product perspective and seeing you know whether those are things that we can take and and and, and have a broad appeal on. And you mentioned ecosystem and WeChat. I mean, f giant social networks like Facebook. You know, if they change their algorithm, they can make and break media companies. Yes. How are your brands kind of walking that tightrope of needing these giant companies, but at the same time needing them more than they need you? How do you kind of deal with that? No, I, I think that's a good point. And obviously, I, I think, you know, the way to do that is obviously making sure that, you know, you're owned and operated, you know, your, your website, your, uh, your existing things that, you know, they're still relevant and there's still enough people that want to come there, but at the same time, have a distributed approach, meaning that you, you, you're not kind of putting all your eggs in one basket saying it's only about Facebook. Facebook is huge. They have 1.5 billion users. So, of course, very meaningful uh, if you want you to get your content out there. But, but there are other platforms, right? You have a LinkedIn, you have a Twitter, you have a, a Snapchat, um, and you have Pinterest, you have, other, you have other platforms. So for us, it's really you know, making sure that for all of our brands, that we have challenge strategies for all of those, meaning, and as I said before, you know, it's really also about, you know, it's not one fits all, right? You can't just create one story and then that story sits across all your channels because yeah. if that's what you're doing, you're also not serving that audience out on the social channels very well and eventually they'll stop kind of reading your, your, your content. And, you know, so content is now running on the platforms and the platforms are now running on Verizon, so to speak, right? Yes. Mobile. So how does, that's a very interesting, the fact that you guys are owned by Verizon now. What advantage does that give you? What is Verizon playing in this role? Because this is, you know. No, I, I think, you know, obviously, as we just talked about, you know, things are shifting from desktop to mobile. You know, most, most publishers and media companies are mobile first companies now. So for, for us, you know, being acquired from Verizon last summer, it obviously, you know, gives us access to, you know, 110 million handsets, uh, which obviously, you know, is a huge advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, Ryzen obviously can decide what's on those handsets. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing it does is obviously it gives us access to a lot of uh, uh, geo data, uh, you know, so first party data on what people are doing uh, when they are on the handsets, which obviously makes a lot of sense if we can get those data and start to think about what are the content experience we need to serve up in you know, those, those particular moments. How much moments. can you see? Can you see like every app, every app that's open? No, right now, we're, we're, right now if, if we wanted, yes, we can see everything. You know, there's some legislation in terms of how much we're actually allowed to do with, uh, with those data. Okay. But obviously, taking those data and then combining it with, with the 400 million uh, people uh, that we have where, where, where we have, you know, obviously a lot of information about those, hopefully that will allow us to, you know, deliver better experiences uh, and also services, you know, launch services, test out how the, those services can sit across that ecosystem because to your point, that is uh, a quite big ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Do you have any predictions about uh, your rival Yahoo? Um, you know, I, I think Yahoo is, uh, you know, has scale, has a big brand, has an interesting product, and, uh, and they're obviously, you know, trying to do what's right for them. Right now, you know, we are focusing on, you know, 
what we need to do in order to you know stay relevant with the with with the audience that we have uh, I, I I think for us it's really about manifesting ourselves in the top five uh, in terms of the big players and obviously uh -huh. you have Facebook and Google at the top I think the closer we can get to that from a scale perspective the, bo the, the better it is for us because what also happens if you if you think about it from a monetization perspective is the closer to the top you are you know the 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 bigger share of the advertising spend you're going to get and right now the latest number i saw is that uh, facebook google is getting right now between 80 and 85% of all online advertising spend so obviously you know we need more scale so we can you know uh, in, yeah. tie tie into that and obviously hopefully uh, get a bigger uh, bigger part of that and we saw from the show of hands we were talking about you know everyone's mobile and social, which you wouldn't see two years ago. Two years from now, what do you expect? How are people getting their content and getting their news? Um, yeah, obviously, uh, as we talked about, mobile, uh, mobile is happening. Uh, you know, uh, video is, 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 of course, also uh, huge in the sense that right now when people log on to the internet, a third of what they do in the US is watching online video. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so obviously, you need to take that format serious. And then I think, obviously, we, we just acquired uh, Riot, which is a virtual reality company, mm -hmm. because we want to kind of we want to test, we want to see what we can do with those more immersive experiences and see if that is delivering something of added value to the audience that's consuming the content we are creating. So I also think you know, augmented and virtual reality is, is going to allow us from a content perspective to serve our content in new and interesting ways that hopefully will engage a bigger audience. When do we, when you think that kind of virtual reality will hit the mainstream? You know, I, I think... We'll be ready for mainstream, I should say. I think at the end of the day, it, it, you need a lot of devices out there for it really to be an immersive experience, right? There are browsers now where you can obviously get part of the experience, but it's not as good as if you have the Oculus Rift or the Samsung or, or the Microsoft uh, uh, VR uh, device. So, so obviously, you know, it's an adoption thing, right? You know, how is... Will the audience actually uh, pay, you know, three to five hundred dollars to get those devices? That's obviously the big question mark here. If if they won't, then obviously, mm -hmm. you know, VR uh, as a scale play is is going to be dead in the water. You know, it, uh, so so we will see. But but hopefully, and you see VR being at least the first immersive video is going to be the, at least probably the first yeah, kind of yeah. content for, for that. Me, for me, immersive video is going to be the first frontier. We already, we've already done a lot of tests with that, and, and the audience has been really engaged with it and really found that, that it opened up uh, new and interesting ways of, of consuming stories or content. Amazing. Well, I think that's a perfect place to end it. Thank you for your time, Jimmy. Thank you. And thank you, guys.